Want a practical challenge for students making up standard solutions for the first time? Or maybe like me, you occasionally find yourself teaching a bit of biology and you need a handy demonstration of osmosis that doesn't take ages to complete. Well, I've got some good news for you today because in both cases, chemistry can and will come to the rescue. It turns out that when copper sulfate reacts with potassium hexacyanoferrate 2, a colloidal suspension is formed which models a semi-permeable membrane pretty effectively. Water molecules are able to pass through much faster than the other species in solution and will move down the concentration gradient from areas where the water is more concentrated to where it is less concentrated. If you make up the solutions at just the right concentrations, it's possible to get a little model cell which is both lower in density than and hypertonic to its surroundings. This means that it will float at first, but then over time as the water diffuses out, it will sink and shrivel up a bit like a crenated cell. While a classic visking or dialysis tubing experiment will barely change in the time taken to explain what's happening inside, this whole process can be done in under two minutes. The trick is, of course, getting the concentrations right. I've provided all of the details in the accompanying article, which you can, of course, find over on the Education and Chemistry website, along with other resources like technician notes at the bottom of the page. Now, the classic version of this demo provides you with solutions that differ in density by just 0.1%. Now, I might charitably describe that as optimistic in a school setting. If you miss that target, then your little cell will sink and further changes won't be as obvious. I know this from first-hand experience. I mess it up so that you don't have to. Begin by recording the empty mass of some 100 centimeter cubed volumetric flasks. Then dissolve each of the powders in about 75 ml of deionized water in a beaker. Transfer the solution to the volumetric flask and rinse the beaker, funnel and stirring rod a couple of times to ensure that all of the solute is now in the volumetric flask. Top up with deionized water to the line before recording the mass of the flask once more and of course don't forget to invert it a few times to thoroughly mix. Note that you need to use potassium hexacyanoferrate 2 for this demonstration. That's the pale yellow stuff, not the bright orange hexacyanoferrate 3 that you may also have in your stock cupboard. Use your recorded masses to check the final density of the solutions that you've made. The copper sulfate solution must be lower in density and it's wise to check your pair of solutions before using in front of a class to make sure that the blue droplet doesn't just immediately sink. If you messed up, you can always add a few drops of water to the copper sulfate solution to try and rescue it. Now you've accurately made these solutions, you want to avoid any cross-contamination. Pour out a few mil of the copper sulfate into a small beaker before drawing it up into a pipette. The yellow solution can go into a boiling tube or a medium-sized test tube, by which I mean somewhere around 15 by 200 mil. Hold these in a clamp. If you use a boiling tube, you will use up more solution each time you do the demonstration, but it will allow you to perhaps get more than one little pea-sized droplet floating and sinking in each one of the demonstrations because the concentration of the surrounding solution isn't going to be changing as quickly. When it comes to drawing up the liquid, I found it tricky to speak to an audience while also controlling the pressure on the teat pipette and also focusing on where I'm delivering it into the solution. So I've made myself this little apparatus here. All it is is a small syringe attached to a pasta pipette um, down on this end. And so what I do is I suck in or draw up just a little bit of air, like less than half a centimeter cube, and then I would dip this into my copper sulfate solution, draw up about half a mil there of the copper sulfate solution. The syringe holds the liquid in place so that I don't have to maintain pressure on a pipette teat, and that tiny little bit of air means that I can get all of the liquid out and I don't have to end up forming a precipitate inside my pipette, which can be tricky to clean. This leaves me able to focus completely on delivering the droplets to near the base of the tube, about one to two centimeters from the bottom. You don't want your little cell to stick to the glass. I press the syringe closed and deliver a pea-sized bubble of blue liquid and immediately remove the pipette. 
If your solutions are very similar in density, then this upwards motion can help the droplets start moving upwards rather than stalling in the middle. A red-brown membrane forms around the droplet as copper ions bind to the hexacyanoferrate 2 ions. Water molecules can diffuse through this from the blue liquid into the yellow one, but the larger complex ions in solution can't get through the membrane as easily. Those water molecules in the blue droplet are much lighter than the hexaqua 2 ion, so as they leave, the density of the droplet increases and eventually becomes great enough that the droplet will sink. All of this will happen in under a minute, assuming you've made up the solutions correctly. And over the next two to three minutes, the little cell at the base of the tube will visibly shrivel up. Even if you botched the solution preparation, you can make some pretty cool chemical gardens. For larger classes, you might want to use a visualizer to help students see what's going on. For this, Shakashiri had the smart idea of constructing a rectangular transparent container filled with water to minimize the lensing effect through the tube. Now, anybody who's been watching for the last couple of years might already be able to predict the piece of apparatus that immediately popped into my head as being an even simpler alternative to constructing such a vessel yourself. You guessed it, it's the cell culture flasks from biology again. Now these ones happen to have an internal neck diameter pretty much equal to the outside diameter of a 15 mil test tube. So you may not even need a clamp. And even if you do, the angle on the, the neck here will hold it in place pretty nicely into your solution. I filled this flask with water and now pay attention to the way that the lensing effect from the water disappears as the yellow solution is poured in. Now we can see the contents of the tube a lot more clearly when placed against a white backdrop. You might use this experiment for a general science lesson on diffusion or transport, but the other thing that it would lend itself to nicely is as a challenge for 16 to 18 year old students making up standard solutions for the first time. If you have a pre-made solution of the hexacyanoferrate 2 and you've calibrated its final density, students could then be challenged to accurately make up their own copper solutions. Any student whose copper droplet sinks right away, they're out of the game. Then it comes down to a competition between the remaining droplets that float. Whoever's droplet is the first to start to sink, having initially floated, must have made up their solution the most carefully. Or, of course, they just got lucky. If you make any nice chemical gardens, time lapses, or run any competitions, be sure to send them back to EIC via the RSC Education contact page. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you again in a couple of months.